Hey guys, Lunch Money Comics here. Happy winter. Today I'm in Lunenburg, Massachusetts at Jeffrey's Antique Co-op Mall. Let's go see if they have some comic books. of X-Men up my alley. So I'm actually switching to the voiceover now because I got hit with a copyright claim for the music playing in the background of this place. So here's Avengers number 268, the second appearance of the Council of Kings. Very cool book, but I already have like three of them in my collection. This is a book I've wanted for a long time. This is the new Avengers number seven, the first appearance of the Illuminati. 
However, this is the Marvel Heroes flipbook version. It was kind of beat up and definitely not worth the $30 they were asking. Uh, the book behind it, Son of Satan number one, another cool book, just not interested. And then I saw this one. This is Wolverine number 88, one of the hottest books in the world right now. It's the first meetup between Wolverine and Deadpool. You can see here it's the deluxe edition, but it's pretty beat up. Lots of color breaking spine ticks, and they were asking $25. I wasn't sure if it was worth it. Did I get it? Well, stay tuned to find out. So there was actually a surprising number of comic books at this antique co-op. As a matter of fact, I didn't have time to go through them all because uh, you can see outside, they're packing up. I was actually there when they closed, they sort of kicked me out. Hey, the weather's pretty bad anyways, so happy to get some pretty great comic books. Can't wait to go home and show you what I got. So there you go, guys. That was Jeffrey's Antique Co-op Mall, that's a mouthful, in Lunenburg, Massachusetts. And the reason I was there is I was visiting a friend in New Hampshire, and whenever I go anywhere, I always do a quick search of, you know, flea markets, antique stores, consignment shops, because I'm always looking for comic books. Uh, this one showed up on the, you know, the search, and it was on my way home, and I decided to check it out. Now, I'd love to tell you guys more about this place, but honestly, I didn't see much of it. As you can tell, there was a ton of comic books, but that's pretty much all I saw. I walked in, I took a right, and like the third or fourth booth I came across had all those comic books on the floor, lots of X-Men books, so I was in my happy place. And as I'm going through those, a gentleman came over and asked me if I was looking for anything particular. I said, comic books, and he said the only other booth that had comic books was in the back corner. So I made a beeline over there, and that was that really big booth you guys saw with big comic sign and just long boxes everywhere. And I decided, oh, I'll just start tackling this, you know, alphabetically. I started with the Avengers box. I got through that box and that gentleman came back and very politely told me that they were closing and I had to leave. So uh, from an antique collector standpoint, I didn't see anything in the store other than comic books. I just made a beeline to the comic books. And from a comic book standpoint, despite the fact there were a ton there, I barely scratched the surface. I'm definitely going to have to go back. Hey, if you are in uh, North Central Massachusetts or like Southern New Hampshire and you're interested in checking it out, I'll make sure to put a link down in the description to Jeffrey's Antique Co-op Mall, whatever it's called. I'll put it down in the description so you can check it out for yourself. Um, the cool thing is I got a pretty good stack of comic books in my short time there and I didn't spend a lot of money. So before I show you guys what I got, if you like this sort of stuff, hit the like button, leave me a comment, feel free to subscribe, follow me on Instagram. Let's see what I found. All right, so this first one is pretty interesting. This is Power Pack number one from 1984, written by Louise Simonson, art by June Brigman, and of course, this is the first appearance of the team Power Pack. They are a team of pre-teen siblings with superpowers, uh, and it was definitely a series marketed towards kids. What's interesting, though, is that, you know, although it was marketed towards kids, there's a lot of very serious issues in here. They tried tackling a lot of, like, the big social issues of the 1980s, like homelessness, drug abuse, child abuse, dilemmas in morality. So um, there's some pretty serious stuff that they were uh, trying to teach kids about. And uh, yeah, they interacted with a lot of other heroes in the Marvel Universe. So uh, Power Pack was never like my big thing. I was never really into them, but I was always cognizant of who they are. I was happy to pick up their first appearance. I think this was $7. What I think is most interesting about Power Pack, though, is that there's been several attempts to bring them to the big screen and the small screen. I guess back in the early 90s, they actually filmed a pilot for a television show. It never got picked up, but that show evidently premiered like on Disney Channel like uh, several times over subsequent decades. But the most interesting thing is, we go back to the 90s, Marvel's in bankruptcy, they start selling away all their movie rights. Notoriously, you know, Spider-Man went to Sony, uh, X-Men and Fantastic Four went to Fox. Um, they didn't have many properties left to them. So when they were starting off Marvel Studios and they saw like what was in their stable, they didn't have much, but Power Pack was one of them and there were serious discussions about sort of starting the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Power Pack. But then, you know, of course, the rights to Iron Man and a lot of the other Avengers reverted back and the rest is history. But who knows, guys, in an alternate reality, maybe the end of uh, Avengers Endgame is, you know, we are Power Pack, you know, unlikely, very unlikely. But um, I still thought that was pretty cool. I'm happy to have their first appearance. And hey, guys, you never know. Uh, Marvel uh, Studios still owns the right to them, obviously, and they could appear at any time, like on a Disney Plus show. So there you go, guys. First appearance of Power Pack. Pretty cool. All right, next up, this is X-Force number eight. It's from 1992, of course, drawn by Rob Liefeld, uh, who also wrote it, along with Fabian Nacesa. And the claim to fame on this one is that it's the first appearance of the character Domino. Now, the character of Domino also showed up on the cover of New Mutants 98, you know, Deadpool's first appearance, but it wasn't actually Domino. It was a character called Copycat. So evidently, this is the first appearance of the real Domino uh, in a comic book. So right there. It's also the uh, origin of Cable is within this book. You find out a lot about his backstory. So it's sort of a double key in that regard. Now, despite the fact that I love all of the X-Men titles, uh, especially in the 1990s when I grew up and was collecting, I was never really into X-Force. 
not exactly sure what it was. Uh, I thought it, at the time it was sort of like the militaristic look of them. Uh, but in retrospect, it was clearly, I just don't really like Rob Liefeld's art. I mean, I'm not alone in that, I don't think. But never really spoke to me. But still, they made a million of the series when it came out. And I have a pretty good run of them. And it's always fun to kind of find these like lesser keys of these. Another cool thing about Domino is that she showed up in the movie Deadpool 2, played by Zazie Beetz. And uh, I think she was one of the coolest parts of that movie. I really like how they showed her luck powers. It was pretty clever how they depicted that. And I feel like of all of the characters that are in that Deadpool franchise that uh, she has the higher likelihood of sort of showing up in a later like X-Men or Deadpool movie, maybe even Deadpool 3, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, hey, who knows? Maybe we'll see her on the silver screen or on a Disney Plus show or something like that in the future. Still think she's pretty cool. X-Force number eight, first appearance of Domino. Oh, so I got it for $6, which I think is actually a pretty good deal for this book. Speaking of Domino and Deadpool, I also found this X-Force number 11. Uh, cool Rob Liefeld cover depicting uh, Deadpool, I think, in his third cover appearance and Domino in her second overall real appearance. And um, I think it's a pretty cool looking book. I actually found one of these in really high grade at a flea market back in the fall. Uh, I think this book is pretty desirable for people who really like Deadpool. So uh, just a cool looking book. X-Force number 11. I got it for five bucks. Not bad. All right. I couldn't make it through an entire video without showing you guys some X-Men. So here we go. This is X-Men number 166 from 1983, of course, written by Chris Claremont, uh, art by Paul Smith on the cover here. And this is the first appearance of the character Lockheed. Lockheed is a small purple alien space dragon. Of course he is. That has very close ties to uh, Kitty Pride, aka Shadowcat, and also Ileana Rasputin, aka Magic. And uh, I really like Lockheed because I was really into Excalibur as a kid. Kitty Pride was on that team and Lockheed was always omnipresent. Very cool character. This is a cool book in general too because the X-Men are in outer space fighting the alien brood and it's always fun when they're in space and you see Lilandra right there on the cover. So cool book, double sized issue. I need it for my run. Bought it for $7 and it's the first appearance of a character I've always liked. Pretty neat. All right, this next book is awesome, guys. This vendor had like 10 copies of this. I've seen it before in the past. It never really jumped out to me uh, until this time. I had to have it. This is Heroes for Hope starring the X-Men number one and it's from 1985. And what this is, is a special issue that says all proceeds from this comic book are being donated to the famine relief and recovery in Africa. So for those of you who are around in the 80s, you may remember that there was a huge famine in East Africa, specifically Ethiopia. And uh, a lot of celebrities, you know, kind of got in on the act in terms of raising awareness and raising money. Very famously, we have the Live Aid concert. You also had the songs We Are the World or Do They Know It's Christmas? Well, Marvel got in on the action as well, published this comic book to raise money for this great cause. But what's so amazing about this comic book, guys, is that it's not written uh, by one person and the art isn't by one person, although the cover is by Arthur Adams, one of my favorites. Every couple pages, the author, the artist, the inker, and the letterer change. And how many people did this? Well, I had to print out the list. Here's a list of everybody who worked in this comic book. And guys, I'm just gonna name a couple of the people on this list. You might have heard of them. Uh, we have uh, Stan Lee starts it off writing a couple of the first pages here. We also have Alan Moore who didn't often do Marvel books. Chris Claremont, of course. Artists, we have John Romita, we have John and Sal Buscema, Frank Miller, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, John Byrne, just to name a few. But what's really neat to me is that a couple of the people who worked in this comic book weren't comic book writers, they were famous writers, including Stephen King and George R.R. R. Martin. Dead serious, pretty neat. My favorite part about this book though is that because the artists change every couple of pages, you can compare the different styles. It's really neat. So I feel like if you're someone who's getting into comic books and you wanna see uh, you know, the differences between the different famous artists, this is a great book to showcase that. In fact, let me open it up and show you what I'm talking about. All right, so here's exactly what I'm talking about. Here we're on pages 20 and 21. Uh, it's Pencils by Mike Kaluta and inked by Al Milgram. But we turn the page and it is Pencils by Frank Miller and inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. And you guys see right there looking at Wolverine, that is clearly Frank Miller Wolverine. And the whole book is like that. You know, every page you turn, that art style changes. But it's not just the art that changes, it's the writing style. So probably the scariest part of the book, uh, I think Kitty Pride is like, suffering some some sort of pestilence or starvation and uh it's really scary you can see she kind of looks like a zombie there it's sort of horrific and who do they have right that of course stephen king so it's even interesting how they parsed out the different story beats in this book so really cool uh whether you are new to the hobby and you want to kind of compare these different styles or even a veteran that just wants to see you know who's in it i mean guys the pedigree of people that worked on this alone makes this worth having and adding to your collection i got this for five dollars it's a really high grade copy I'm sure you can find this in your local comic book store. Guys, I highly recommend you guys uh, seek this one out. I think it's a worthy addition to anyone's collection. Fun little footnote uh, in comic book history, and I'm really happy to have found it. 
All right, I know you guys saw these in the footage. Uh, I found Infinity Gauntlet number two, number three, number five, love that cover, and number six. So of course, uh, the Infinity Gauntlet was a limited series, uh, six issues in 1991, written by Jim Starlin, art by George Perez and Ron Lim. And it tells the story of, of course, Thanos assembling the six Infinity Stones, putting them in the gauntlet and causing all sorts of trouble. Most people in the world, I think, know about this storyline a little bit because of the Avengers movies, uh, Infinity War and Endgame, which were loosely based off of this saga. Um, whenever I can find these guys, I pick them up. These were $4 each, so I think that's a great deal. Of course, the two that we're missing are two of the uh, most iconic ones, but I have other copies here to show you. Uh, here is number one, very famous cover. I have it in the raw. I also have it graded. Um, and number four, which I was really looking closely for because it's a great cover. Um, I couldn't find it, but I had another one to show you guys. This is Infinity Gauntlet number four with a really cool Thanos on the cover saying, uh, come and get me. Uh, so there you go, guys. Uh, like I said, whenever I can find these cheap, I like picking them up. It's always fun to build out these uh, limited series, uh, especially when you can find them cheap. If you haven't read the series, uh, try to collect it raw. It's always fun to read. But if not, definitely go get a trade paperback. It's a great story to read and uh, sort of distance yourself from what you saw in the movies. I think the whole storyline uh, is much cooler in the comic books. So yeah, happy to pick up some more issues of this, guys. Keep your eyes open for them. They can be found out there. All right, we finally get to the last book, guys. So I almost missed this when I was there. I was going through all those Avengers books, you know, those big long boxes. That gentleman came over and said, you know, we're closing. I had to leave. So I did like one more once over of all the nice books up on the wall. And uh, my eye settled on this one. Uh, this is an incredibly popular hot book right now. And uh, I've always said on my channel, like, uh, I have a list of rules I keep in my phone to, you know, make sure I don't overpay for things. Um, and I promise I'll talk about these rules sometime on my channel. But one of those rules is um, don't buy the hype. FOMO is dumb. And what that means is, you know, if there's a book that's really hot, don't jump on the bandwagon and try to buy it then. Wait for the hype to die down and get it when it's cheaper. And that's certainly the case with this book and why I was definitely not seeking this book out. But I had to pick it up and I'll tell you why. This is Wolverine number 88 from 1994, written by Larry Hama, art by Adam Kubert. And this is the first uh, battle and ma matchup between Deadpool and Wolverine. And the reason why this book is so hot right now, of course, is because of the movie Deadpool 3, which will be co-starring Hugh Jackman back as Wolverine. So because we expect these guys to be duking it out, you know, these two mutants with uh, the ability to heal themselves, uh, it's a really interesting battle, really interesting dynamic between these two characters. Now, the reason I got this book was because it isn't in great shape. It actually has a lot of color-breaking spine ticks. This is the deluxe edition. This is a million different uh, editions. This one has like a sturdier paper quality, I guess. But because of that, you know, the spine ticks that does show up are, are really obvious. And, um, you know, you can't really tell here, but I definitely showed it in the footage when I was in the store. Um, it was $25, which I thought, you know, for the condition it's in, it's not worth having. But I decided as I'm walking out just to do a quick check on eBay, and I noticed there were a lot of uh, copies of this book that were in worse condition selling for higher. So when I actually thought about it, I realized that $25 for this book, even right now with, you know, the hype as high as it is, is actually a pretty good deal for this book. Um, I'm going to read this book. I don't know what I'm going to do with it after I read it. Um, I kind of feel like it's a book that I don't necessarily need to have in my collection, despite the fact I am a fan of Wolverine and the X-Men in general. But it's definitely a cool book uh, to have right now. And maybe, you know, I'll find a way to, you know, trade it or uh, sell it to someone who likes Deadpool a little bit more than me. So there you go, guys. That's uh, Wolverine uh, number 88 extremely hot book. If you can find it cheap, it's worth having. But otherwise, I think this is a book you probably wait for the hype to die down and get it cheaper in a couple of years. So there you go, guys. I got a pretty good stack of comic books in the limited time I was there, and I did not break the bank. I spent a grand total of $71. Not too shabby. That's the kind of lunch money purchases I like the most. So uh, let me know down in the comments which one of these pickups you like the best. Uh, for me personally, I think it's actually this one. It's not worth that much, but I definitely think it's the most interesting. In the meantime, guys, you know, keep hunting for comic books in strange and unusual places. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time.